Well, good morning, church. Welcome to River of Life. Uh, my name is Gerald. I'm pastor here at this church, and uh, so glad that you're joining us. Uh, one of the things we are doing right now is we are going through a Advent series called Behold, a Savior is Born. And uh, today, I uh, want to ask you just a simple question. Do you like Christmas surprises? Like, or, or I mean, are you the type of person that loves people just, you know, throwing things on you just last minute, or are you a planner? Are you the type of person, like, you, you want to know exactly, okay, we're, we're having eggnog at 7.05, we're, we're doing, like, you, you've, got, you've got everything down to the wire, everything to the minute. You know, it's like, you, there, I, I feel like there's two different types of people when it comes to that stuff, right? The, some people are just, they love the excitement, they love, you know, being surprised. Some people are more no, you know, don't, don't surprise me. Let me know when you're coming over. Let me know when you're planning on leaving. You know, I, and just, you know, just the, you have that in, in mind. Uh, we, we had kind of some fun this weekend. Uh, my daughter's in a play, and so we surprised her by bringing in my, uh, my dad and stepmom and my, cut, or my niece. And so uh, she was just absolutely floored. It was not ready for it. It was exciting. Um, and, and we know, like, for some of those types of surprises, you have to make it a surprise, because my niece didn't know it was a surprise, and like the whole time, it's like, when are we going to see them? When are we going to see them? When are we going to see them? When we, so like, you, got, you, you have to plan your surprises right, because you don't want the person going, okay, now when? Now when? Now when? You know, and so when we, when we look at that, you know, we recognize that that is a big part of what Christmas is about. It's that joy of surprise. It's that joy that there, there's something unexpected, whether it's the present under the tree that you're not quite sure what it is. You know, you shook it, you, you kind of tried to peel the, the wrapping back a little bit, and you, you still, you, you just don't know what that is under the tree. Or, like I said, it might be family members coming along that you weren't expecting. It might be different things that are going on. And, I mean, the truth is some of them aren't good either. Like, sometimes we're going through Christmas and things happen and we're not expecting it. You know, the cake burns, or, you know, you, you drop the turkey on the floor, or, or, or whatever the case may be. Like, there, there's going to be things that are going to happen, but we, we have to trust that there's, there's still going to be a way to use those things, redeem those things, and, and allow it to be something good for God's glory. Uh, one thing that I'd really, I, I'm, I'm the planner type, and so I don't like surprises. And so my plan every uh, Sunday is that you would take time and fill out your Connect card. And so if you did not do that already, uh, you still have time. You can turn it in uh, to the sound booth or to the coffee station on your way out. If you're joining us online, welcome. We're glad you're here, whether you're joining us on Facebook or our online service. You can do this digitally by texting the word RIVER to 715 953 4060, and you'll get a digital version of that in just a moment, and you can follow along. So, as I mentioned, we are continuing our series about this, a Savior is born, and we're looking at the different concepts that Advent is about, the, the ideas that are Every year, we kind of go through this rhythm. I mean, we're, we're a little bit ahead of schedule uh, for the normal Advent season, but we are going to look at today the servant love that we find in the Christmas story. Because that was probably one of the most surprising parts about Christmas. It would have been one of the most surprising parts to the Jewish people as they were waiting for the coming of the Messiah. So many of them were expecting a conquering hero. So many of them were expecting someone who would come in might and power. And though Jesus did, in essence, come in might and power, he also took on humility. You know, as, as we prepare, I was getting together with some pastors here in the community, and one of the things that we talked about is how sometimes it's hard to come up with a good Christmas message or a good Christmas series because it's like these concepts have been told over and over and over again. It's hard to do anything that's going to surprise anyone. You know, and there, there's a part of that that's not terrible. Part of the reason why we have this hope is because it's a hope that's been repeated. It's a hope that's been reinforced. It's a hope that's been told over and over again. And so, um, so there, there's, a, there's a power in the repetition, in a reminding ourselves of what Christmas is about. But also, I think it is good to take 
time, especially if you're familiar with the story, and look at it from different angles and try to surprise ourselves with things that we might not be expecting to see in the story. And so today, I'm actually going to use a very surprising Christmas story. I'm going to use a letter that was written to the Philippians. And this wouldn't maybe typically be a passage read for Christmas, but I believe it is the Christmas story distilled into a very succinct message. And it talks about this servant love of Jesus. And so I invite you to stand for me for the reading of God's word. We're going to look at Philippians chapter 2 and verses 5 through 11. We kind of looked at this a couple weeks ago, but you know, as I was preparing, like this would be really good to actually look at and see what is, um, what, what is this telling us about the servant love of God. And so it looks like my thing died again, so if you can help me out, thank you. Awesome. So we are looking at Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 11, and today we're going to be reading out of the New Living Translation, and this is how it reads. You must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. Although he was God, he did not think himself of equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges. He took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being. When he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on a cross. Therefore, God elevated him to a place of highest honor and gave him a name that was above all other names, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue declare that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Let me pray for us today. Jesus, I do pray that we would be amazed by your servant love. That though there's many of us in this room who we've grown up hearing these stories, we've grown up understanding the truth that's here, I pray that you would reinstill the wonder, reinstill the sense of awe that we should have that you came to be with us. God, I pray that as we look into your word that you would speak to every heart that every person in this room, every person who's joining us online, we would all have a sense that you are here with us, that you are speaking something to our hearts that's new and fresh. And God, that you would use me or you would work outside of me, but don't let anyone leave here without knowing they have met with you. God, we just we thank you for the privilege of being able to call you our Lord as we pray these things in your powerful name. Amen. Amen. Why don't you turn to a person or two and wish them a Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas to those of you who are joining us online. Please let us know where you're worshiping from and, and how uh, we can stay connected with you. And then you are able to find your seat. So... As we're looking at the servant love of Jesus, I want to talk about some of the things that would have been a little bit surprising about his love. You know, some of the areas that kind of speak to how when he came and when he decided to interrupt history with his presence, there, there was a few surprising things about his love. So the first thing that I want to talk about this morning is how his love was shown through his divinity. That he surprised us with his love through his divinity. That this is a a story of God coming to be with us. But the amazing thing is, he, he did it in a way that only God could do. When we, when we look at our sacrifice, when we look at what was necessary, I mean, I think all of us, we don't have to look very hard to recognize the world's broken. We don't, we don't have to look very hard in our own lives to realize there's, there's parts of our lives that are broken. And so many people who try to figure out their lives apart from God, they, they can come to a point and they can, they can do all sorts of great things to try to make their lives better or try to make the lives of the people around them better. 
But unless they recognize the issues we face are of such proportion that only God can speak to them, you will often find yourself finding one solution only to find a whole different problem. Fixing one thing only to realize there's something broken over here. In that unless we're willing to turn to God and allow Him to be the answer to this brokenness, we will constantly be hitting our heads against the walls, wondering why the world is the way it is. And so one of the things we see here is that He loved us through His divinity, that He had a God-sized answer, but He brought it in the form of a baby. In, In verse six and seven, we read this. It says, though he was God, talking about Jesus, though he was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges. I mean, that, that has to be one of the most surprising parts about the gospel, is that God the Son, through the person of Jesus Christ, came into humanity. He had the ability to solve all of the world's problems. He had the power to do whatever he desired because he was God. But he submitted himself to God the Father's plan. And it it says he, he gave up his divine privileges. One of the things that I really appreciate a couple years back, and, and if you, if you didn't, weren't with us when we went through the series, I w- want to challenge you, take some time, look through the book of Luke. We, we did a very long study on the book of Luke, and one of the things that you see when you look at that, if you, if you pay attention, is how often Jesus submitted himself to the Holy Spirit. Jesus was God. He was fully God. But yet, when he came and he was born into the family of Mary and Joseph, he put aside his divine privileges. He put aside his access to supernatural power. He he could have experienced a life that was free of pain, free of anything else that would cause it to be uncomfortable. But he willingly put that aside. And he submitted himself to the Holy Spirit. We, we see that as his ministry went, he was constantly being led by the Spirit. He was constantly going to the Father through prayer in that he talked about the reason why he was able to do the things he did is because he connected himself to the Father through the Holy Spirit. And so his love was shown through his divinity, not only from the fact that he was God, but that he submitted himself to God and to God's plan. And, and so that, that part is absolutely amazing that we can see that God loved us that much that he actually took his own privileges and set them aside. You know, and, and that's surprising to us because it's not the norm. It, it, you know, when, when we look at Christmas, Christmas is usually a lot of people wanting what they want. No, I, I want that present. I want that thing. I want... It to be hosted at my house. I want to be serving this meal. I want to be serving these things. I want this because it reminds me of when I was young. You know, it's, and there, there's nothing wrong with trying to recreate tradition and, and trying to produce an atmosphere where Christmas is fun and enjoyable. But one of the most beautiful parts about Christmas, one of the things that can make Christmas more mere what God designed it to be is when we choose to put aside our own comfort when we choose to put aside our own desires, when we, even when we have the ability to be the strongest person in the room, our willingness to be weak for the sake of other people, that's when we really begin to show the world that we have gotten a hold of what Jesus was really about. So he loved us through his divinity. The other thing we see is we see love through his humanity. That when he came to be here on earth. As I mentioned, he chose to completely submit himself to the humanness of what it was to be God. He, he submitted himself to the plan of saying, I'm going, to, I'm going to have this experience just like everyone else. 
in verse 7, we also read this, that though that he took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being. He took this humble position and he allowed himself to be born and to experience what all of us experience, birth and family and and conflict in family, and pain, and suffering, and the loss of family members. I mean, there's, there's a pretty strong nod in the Gospels that at some point he had to have buried Joseph, like his, his, his earthly father. You know, so like he was not exempt from pain. He was not exempt from suffering. And, and he, at just the right time, came into humanity. I, I want to read the Christmas story that we're probably a little bit more familiar with. But as I read this, I want us to think about the fact that Jesus came to be with us. He came to experience all that we came to experience. He came in time and place and among a people and and in a situation that was not the best situation. Yet, that gives evidence of how he loved us through his humanity. Let's go ahead and read this passage in Luke uh, chapter 2. Again, this is the Christmas story. It says, At the time of the Roman Emperor Augustus decreed that a census should be taken through the Roman Empire. This was the first census taken when Quirinius was governor in Syria. All returned to their own ancestral towns to register for the census. And because Joseph was a descendant of King David, he had to go to Bethlehem in Judea, David's ancient home. He traveled there from the village of Nazareth to Galilee. He took with him Mary, who was engaged, who was now expecting a child. And while they were there, the time came for her baby to be born. She gave birth to her firstborn son. She wrapped him snugly in strips of cloth, and laid him in a manger because there was no lodging available for them. So, so here we see this story. Here we see that God came to be with us. You know, and I think all of us are familiar with this. All of us are recognize his love through coming to be with us. But I, I think what we need to recognize is again, he didn't he didn't spare himself from what humanity was like. He didn't even, you know, you you would think if God knew this was happening and God had this plan, he at least would have planned for a hotel room to be ready in Bethlehem or a nice hospital, right? That that he would have have orchestrated the, the world so that the best medical care was available to Mary. But no. She was giving birth in a barn. She was separated from her family. She was in a strange town among strange people who had no compassion on her situation. And this is where Jesus enters the world. And all throughout his ministry, he showed his humanity by willingly choosing to be with us and and to to experience the same hardships, the same difficulties that we do. Which kind of brings us to our last thing. Not only did he love us through his divinity, not only did he love us through his humanity, he also loved us through his humility. That this God, this creator of the universe, choose to be humble. He chose the position of a servant. As we keep reading in Philippians, it says, He took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being. When he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on a cross. That he decided to completely submit to the Father's will. He said, I'm not going to ask for special privileges. I'm not going to ask for special position. I'm going to go and I'm going to humbly serve and even serve on a cross. As we've been going through this series, I've been trying to bring it back to the cross every week. 
because that's really what it's about. It's not just about that he came to be born in a manger, but that he ultimately came to die for our sins. That he ultimately came to be that servant, to suffer and die for us so that we could know what it was to truly be free. You know, one of the axioms in the Bible is this, that if you will humble yourself, God will exalt you. If you will choose to serve others, God will serve you through his presence and through his power. And Jesus exemplifies this. He chose to die for us. He chose to take on a criminal's death so that we can know what it is to be free. And that's why we see the end result in verses 9 through 11. Paul writes, Therefore, God elevated him to a place of highest honor and gave him a name above all other names, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue declare that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. He did this so that in the end, he would be exalted. In the end, his humility would bring room for all of us to come into the kingdom. That, that he went through all of this because his love was that great. And his love willingly served us. It willingly stepped outside of itself to make sure that we would understand what true love really was. That we would know that this God who loved us has now been exalted and that we, by loving him and choosing to love like he loved, can see his power on display in us. The big thing that I really want us to get this Christmas season, the thing that I I hope we can take into the family gatherings and the workplace celebrations and the different things that we do throughout this season is that we would recognize that you can reflect his love. That you have the ability to be just like him. We, we read it in verse 5, that we should have the same attitude as Christ. That means we have the ability to reflect his love. We have the ability to allow ourselves to be poured out. I mean, obviously, we can't love anybody through divinity, right? You know, like we, we, don't, we don't have access to that, but we do have access to the Holy Spirit. And we can allow ourselves to be led by him. We can choose to use our frailties and our insecurities and the things that we're uncertain of and, and push beyond that to serve other people. As we've taken time leading up to the Christmas season trying to understand our sentness that we would recognize that, yes, we're frail, yes, we, we have problems, but we can, even in our humanity, we, we can still reach out to people and show them love, even if it's imperfect, even if we're going to mess it up, even if we're going to offend some people at some times, even if we are going to do things that are going to make us look foolish. We can still love in that way. And the biggest thing is we, we can do it in a humble manner so that we aren't trying to get our way this Christmas, but we're trying to give Jesus' his. We're trying to allow our lives to reflect his goodness. You know, it's, it's something that we have to realize that this is what Christmas is about. It's about that self-sacrificing, self-giving love that we first saw demonstrated in its fullness through Christ, but that the church has been called to take on and to extend to the world around us. I mean, honestly, it starts in this room. I know, I hope at this point you guys know one of my favorite verses, which Jesus gives us the key to whether or not we are truly his disciples. He says, they will know that you are my disciples 
by the love you have for each other. That if we will learn to love each other, then we have the ability to show God his love. We can reflect his love to other people. And so, I don't know what you have planned. I I don't know if you have cookies to decorate. I don't know if you have turkeys to cook. I don't know if you have presents left to wrap. I don't know what you have in store. But I pray part of it would be a desire to see the love of Christ manifest in your life and in the lives of the people around you. And so, this Christmas, a couple more things to add to your Christmas list. Number one, receive Christ's love. Even if you're already a Christian, this could be a season for you just to say, God, help me, help me to understand this a little bit better. Help me to regain some of the awe. I mean, we, we, we started with this idea of loving surprises or, or desiring, I mean, again, maybe you're not one of those people who love surprises, but I hope you would desire to regain your awe in who Christ is. We, we have been told these stories for 2,000 years. Some of us have heard these stories for decades. And, and they can just be that, just stories. I would ask you to simply turn to God this season and say, God, help me to, help me to receive this again. Help me to receive this fresh and new. Help, help me help me to see what your love really has done for me, that I could truly be grateful. And maybe that's taking some time and reading through the Gospels. Maybe it's just taking time and having some dedicated prayer to say, God, I, I, want, I want to be grateful for what you've done for me. And taking time and listing his blessings, listing the things he's done, listing the relationships he's put in your life, listing the ways in which he has shown himself to be faithful. Take time this Christmas and reflect on his love. Receive it for yourself, but then also reflect it back. Find opportunities to reflect God's love to the people around you. Again, I don't know what situations you're walking into, I don't know how difficult this Christmas is going to be for you. I don't know who's not going to be at the table that's going to cause some hurt. I don't know what situations have been festering in your family for years. But I do know this. You have the ability to be the one to showcase God's love. You have the ability to be the one that says, I'm going to, I'm going to love even when it's inconvenient. I'm going to be humble even when I know they're the ones that wronged me. I'm going to be willing to serve even if it makes me look like the lesser one. Because that's what Jesus did. And that's why he's still so hard to get our minds around. That's why for 2,000 years, This mystery of God with us has yet to penetrate every heart because it is so against everything we've ever experienced. But the beautiful part is we're promised, as we already read, that one day every knee will bow, every tongue will confess. The only question is how many of them will do it now because of you? How many of them will be able to see Christ live out his love through your life because that is what we're ultimately called to do. So that's what I have for us this Christmas. And I would really pray that you would look for opportunities to live out this Christmas list. I'm going to invite the worship team to come back up. At this time, I'd also invite you to stand. I just want to pray for us as we go into this Christmas season. Again, we've got two, two weeks until Christmas Eve. I hope you're able to join us for a Christmas Eve service. But even if you're not, let's go out and expect that there would be something amazing when we make room for Christ. When we say, I'm going to be the one that will invite Christ in. I'm going to be the one that will let who Christ is affect who I am this Christmas season. 
and that we would look for those opportunities. So let me pray for us, and then we'll sing one more song. But let me, let me, let me, let us go to the Father right now. Jesus, we thank you. We thank you for your love. We thank you for your goodness. We thank you for the surprising truth that God came to be with us. God, we confess sometimes we we are no longer overwhelmed by that joy. We are no longer impressed by that story. I pray that this would be a, a time, this season, that we could actually come back to that awe, that, that, that pure joy in knowing that you loved us this much. That we would not take your love for granted. We would not take the blessings you put in our lives for granted. But that we would truly carry these things as the precious gifts that they are, but that we'd be willing also to pass them on to others. God, I pray that you would draw every heart in this room to you. That everyone who's joining us online, that they would sense you calling them to yourself. Matter of fact, why don't, why don't we all just take a moment and just simply ask Jesus in. You can do it with your own words. You can do it out loud. Just, just say it, something simple like, Jesus, I need you. This year, I make room for you. I'm sorry for living my own life. Help me to live for you. Holy Spirit, fill me. Lead me, guide me. Help me to experience Jesus' mm -hmm. love. And then show me who I'm supposed to give it away to. God, I thank you for the new life you've given me. You have all of my life. Amen. Amen. I just pray that you would walk out of here with that sense. And as we sing this last song, maybe take a moment and, and reflect on what Christ has done for you so that you can better reflect it back to the world around us. We're going to have some of our prayer partners over here, so if you need prayer for anything, uh, please Seek out one of them. Or again, maybe you just need to take a moment right where you're at and just humbly ask God to be that light in your life, that that would reflect a little bit more every day. I love you guys. Merry Christmas. Hope to see you guys back next week.